we're going to talk a little bit more about dynamics in relativity. Uh, and again, always from a geometrical point of view. Um, but one thing I want to do is really finish up something I could have done the last video, but it was getting long. Comparison to the comparison to Newtonian mechanics. And the main thing is to make sure that these names, energy, momentum, mass, that they're not just names and that they actually make sense um, in comparison to the Newtonian ideas. And then I want to talk about uh, some really fundamental ideas about invariance and conservation. So we were at the point where we had a um, really fundamental equation, e squared minus p squared equals m squared. And then that was supplemented by if we have the velocity, then just a very simple fact that e over p is a measure of the direction in space-time of the energy momentum vector, said that p was e ev. And remember, all of this is with c equals 1. And as necessary, I'll put in the c's um, to, to make it more like real physics. Um, and we had e was um, approximately equal to mc squared, that's the rest energy, plus 1 half mv squared plus a correction term. But actually, just let's just say it's approximately equal to that. Okay, So this was a big part of the evidence that these words, energy and mass, do actually mean what, what we think they mean. That's, it really couldn't be too far off if we're seeing this come out of the expression. Now, of course, we got the correction terms. This is only approximate. But we talked about how that, that doesn't matter too much for low velocities. Let me just complete that. What about the momentum? That's just EV. So that's approximately going to be um, m. And let me do it without the c squared for a second. That's going to be uh, mv plus 1 half mv cubed. OK. Well, this is the ordinary, notation, ordinary Newtonian expression for momentum. So in fact, even without the c squareds artificially put back in, it actually happens to work out in the right units. This clearly doesn't work out in the right units. If you actually put the units back in, then this is going to be 1 half mv cubed over c squared. In any case, this has two more powers of v over c, or just what I call v, in the expression. And so again, it's something that nobody ever noticed with relatively low velocity experiments, um, think where the velocities are a lot less than the speed of light. So once again, yes, the Newtonian version, the low velocity approximation, says this quantity p that we've identified as the um, the space component of the energy momentum vector really does behave like mv, which is the Newtonian momentum. So that's part of why we get to call these things energy, momentum, and mass. But there's really a deeper reason as well, and that's that the fundamental reason energy and momentum are so important in mechanics is that they're conserved. And we already have the original postulate was that this vector composed of e and p put into a vector was a conserved vector. And you can verify that in experiments, that this is really is conserved. Um, so that's the main reason why they're important. And then the reason we get to call them these particular names, energy and momentum, is that they're not just some random pair of new conserved quantities that we've never seen before. They really correspond to, uh, at least approximately for low velocities, to the Newtonian energy, kinetic energy and momentum that we knew were conserved as well. At least we thought they were exactly conserved. Now we see that they're actually just approximately conserved. What's really conserved is the relativistic energy and momentum with the corrections put in. So here's an example of uh, how this works and a, and, you know, and a su somewhat surprising consequence. So I'm going to have a 1 kilogram mass and another 1 kilogram mass come in. Uh, and according to this coordinate system, they're coming in with equal and opposite velocities of, let's say, um, this guy's coming in from the left, root 3 over 2c. And this guy's coming in from the right, root 3 over 2c. Now, if you naively add those two numbers together, you might think, oh, this guy thinks this guy's coming in with root 3c velocity. And you might think, wait, isn't that supposed to be impossible? The velocities aren't supposed to, to increase, uh, to go over 1. Well, indeed, just adding these velocities is absolutely wrong. And we'll see later why that's wrong and why analogies to Euclidean geometry can tell us why it shouldn't ever be true. But um, let's look at what happens if these collide. 
And what that, what's going to happen if I look at the, um, let's call this mass A, B, and C. Then here's P A, here's P B, looking pretty symmetrical in this uh, this coordinate system. And here's P P C. Oh, and they all get arrows. They're all vectors. Okay. Um, and I just want to see what happens with that. What is C going to look like? Okay. So um, we know that, like for this mass, E A P A. What's that going to be? Well, we have formulas for that. E A. Remember was m gamma, and uh, that's so that's m over the square root of one minus. Conveniently, that's chosen so that the square is is nice. This is exactly the same gamma factor we had in the train example, and it just works out to two m, or two kilograms, or if we want to put the c's back in, it's two kilograms times c squared, which is a ridiculous amount of energy. Um, because that, that c squared is so big, and that's um, 2 times 10 to the 16th or something joules. Remember, most of that energy is probably not going to be available in real life situations, although we're going to see that a lot of it um, is, is kind of going to do something interesting in this particular example. Notice that one these two masses coming at, together at this velocity, that's an incredible amount of, of kinetic energy. Um, but I just wanted to make all the numbers simple. Um, Okay, so that's EA. Okay, now I could get the PA as just by just multiplying this by root three over two, but I don't really need that because from the symmetry of the picture, it's clear that the P's are going to cancel. Okay, and then the EA and the EB are actually going to be exactly equal. The time component of these vectors is equal. Okay, so let's look at the EC PC. Okay, that's going to be something comma zero. And because of the conservation, so these equal and opposite x components are canceling to add to 0. And conservation says that the EC is just the sum of the energies of the previous two. So it's just 4 kilograms or 4 kilograms c squared. Okay. So the unsurprising thing is that energy has been conserved. But the really, really um, surprising thing from a Newtonian point of view is that mass is not conserved. 1 kilogram and 1 kilogram somehow magically added up to be a mass that was 4 kilograms. Really, really important that mass is not conserved. And I alluded to that uh, in the previous video by talking about if the mass can change, that's how it can sort of slosh around between mass and, and kinetic energy. We've got this expression that E is the mc squared plus 1 half mv squared, approximately. And if you can change this from the before and after, that could contribute to a big change in this. Here, we're, what's happening is the, the relative kinetic energy of these two masses is being converted into rest mass. Okay, So the energy, the, what, what you might call the mass energy, and because they can slosh between each other, the mass energy is conserved. But here, a lot of it was in the form of relative kinetic energy. Here, it's all purely in the form of rest mass. So mass is not conserved is really, really, really important. OK, but let's, let's think geometrically about that. We haven't sort of analogized to Euclidean geometry in a little bit. Um, this picture may look familiar. That's a triangle. The very first thing we did in relativity was the twin paradox. And that was something where this was the, uh, the actual uh, a separation vector an actual journey by Paul, another journey by Paul, and this was a journey by Peter. What we discovered is that the, um, the magnitude of this vector, which was a proper time uh, duration or lapse in that case, is not the sum of these two. And that was surprising from the perspective of Newtonian mechanics, but it's totally unsurprising from the perspective of geometry. Nobody's going to be surprised if somebody says this length is different from the sum of these two lengths. Well, look, that's exactly what we're saying here. The mass is supposed to be the magnitude of this vector. That's the mass of the outgoing particle. The sum of the masses of these guys is exactly the sum of the magnitudes of these ones. So again, from Euclidean geometry, we would never expect mass to be conserved if we know that mass is analogous to the length of the arrow. And the triangle inequality says that these shouldn't be equal unless everything's collinear and then the, nothing really is happening. There's no relative motion. Okay. And because it's the reverse triangle inequality, we know that this guy's bigger. 
we know that, that the mass of C is going to be greater, which is surprising in the analogy to Euclid, but we know to expect that, that reversal, that the mass is going to be greater. Now that, is, it does make sense if you think about that this idea that mass can be created out of, out of energy of motion, that these guys have this energy of motion that, can be crea that gives this bigger mass. It would be we really weird if this had a smaller mass, that somehow this energy of motion actually contributed to making this actually smaller in terms of mass. But I really love the fact that it's exactly analogous to the twin paradox and exactly analogous to the triangle inequality in Euclidean geometry. If you just start to believe that mass is the magnitude of a vector, you'd never expect it to be conserved. So let me talk about conservation and invariance in general to finish up this video. There's two kinds of things that you'd really like for a quantity um, in physics. One is, is it conserved in collisions? Is it something where you take the sum of them on the in, in coming in and the sum of them going out, and you get the same answer? Okay. There's another thing that you definitely would like, and that's invariance. That's something being the same, but in a very different way. So this is like in a collision and uh, the initial and final sums. Are those the same? Invariance means not before and after, but just looking at some object, uh, if you're looking at different observers, different coordinate systems, do those agree? There's one other thing that you might want to judge, and that's not necessarily a plus or minus or good or bad thing, is is the quantity you're looking at a scalar quantity or a vector quantity? Is it just a number or is it an arrow? Okay, And in some sense, scalar is a little better because it's simpler. Okay, so let's look at the quantities we have. We've got the energy momentum vector. That breaks down in coordinates to be the energy separately and the momentum separately. And then its magnitude is the mass. Okay, so the energy and the momentum separately, sort of what Newton's uh, laws love to consider, E and P separately, uh, they are scalars or I wanted to, don't even want to call them scalars, though, because often the word scalar implies it's a number and it's invariant. They're numbers, but they're not invariant. They're incredibly useful for calculations, um, but they're not invariant. Don't assume that your E number is going to agree with somebody else's from a different coordinate system, a different observer. But they are conserved because they are components of a, the conserved vector, the energy momentum. Okay, so it's really important that they are not invariant, but they are conserved. That's the good and the bad of E and P. Okay, what about M? The mass is exactly the opposite. The mass, that's a number as well, just an ordinary number, and it really does deserve to be called a scalar because it's invariant. It is something that every observer is going to agree on. For a particular particle with a particular energy momentum for a vector, it's going to be invariant, okay? But it's, we just discovered it's not conserved, and there's really, really big reasons why it couldn't possibly have been conserved by this geometric analogy, okay? So E and P, energy and momentum, are not invariant, but they're conserved. Mass is invariant, but not conserved. That's a really, really, really nice thing to, to remember. And I claim there's one and only one quantity that actually has both these good properties. It's the vector itself. The vector, so you have to give up just having a single number. It has to be a vector. But the energy momentum vector is invariant. It's an honest to god geometric arrow. If you actually have to reduce it down to numbers, its components, then you're going to lose the invariance because you have to choose the coordinate system to make it into two numbers. But as an honest to god just arrow in the page, it is invariant. It's just that's. An invariant vector is just a little bit more complicated quantity than um, an invariant number, um, and it is conserved. Okay, so there is something that has both good properties, but it it's a vector, so it's a little more complicated. But in terms of the numbers, the E, P, and M, is really nice to know. E and P are not invariant, but are conserved in collisions, and M is invariant, but it is not conserved. It's exactly analogous to in Euclidean geometry taking coordinates 
and looking at coordinates of like triangles and things like that, there's lots of relationships that correspond to the conservation law about positions of coordinates of vectors and, and when you make triangles, things like that. Um, and then the M is analogous to the length of a vector, which you don't expect um, the triangle equality to be true. It's triangle inequality, but it's not something that depends on coordinates. Okay.